Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that on behalf of March of the Living Australia, we welcome you to tonight's webinar, during which we will be hearing from two speakers and then have a Q&A session at the end via the chat function. Our first speaker is Linda Royal. Now, Linda is a writer, a filmmaker and educator, and Linda will be sharing an incredible story about Mr. Chuni Sugihara, a righteous Gentile who did so much good for so many Jews during World War II. Following that, we will hear from our second speaker, who is Rabbi Levi Wolf. Now, Rabbi Wolf is the rabbi at Central Synagogue in Bondi Junction in Sydney and the grandson of a Sugihara visa recipient. Rabbi Wolf will also be sharing a very interesting story about his family and their involvement in, in, the, in years gone by. Very interesting indeed. So I look forward to hearing these two very interesting stories, after which we will engage in discussion. So without further ado, I will hand over to Linda. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Linda Royal. I'm also a writer and I shouldn't be alive. The daughter of a Polish Jew born in 1929 Odds were against me ever being born, given that 95% of Polish Jews were wiped out. But before I begin, um, firstly, I'd like to express my gratitude to the organisers, but I'd like to welcome my long-standing friend, Nabuki Sugihara, who I believe is with us this evening. Hi, Nabuki. Uh, he is the only surviving son of righteous among the nations, Chuani Sugihara, who I actually accosted Nabuki with a big hug when I first met him. I did ask permission first, uh, being the closest thing to hugging the man to whom I owe my very existence. Also joining us is Rabbi Levi Wolf of the Central Synagogue in Bondi Junction, who's been a great supporter of mine and my efforts along the way, and is equally as passionate as I am about being the descendant of a Subihara survivor. First, let me thank Cedric Geffen for reaching out to me and offering me this amazing opportunity under the banner of March of the Living. It's an organization that plays a vital role in perpetuating Holocaust education and celebrating the existence of Israel. As far as I'm concerned, we as descendants of those who perished are all on an individual march ourselves in everyday life as living, breathing, um, educators who must not be silenced. It's the duty of all of us to speak for those who are abruptly and brutally silenced. We do not need to be at a concentration camp or a memorial in order to feel the impact of the Holocaust. We need to square, Johnny. Next. It's unfortunately all around us. It lives on in the survivors in our community. It is highlighted by anti-Semitic attacks globally and it's in the DNA of victims, children, us, the descendants, who carry generational trauma. So who am I really? Most importantly, I'm a proud Jew and someone who is only alive because a stranger followed his conscience and reached out to save desperate people, amongst them, my father and grandparents who were pictured there. Almost my entire family on both my mother's and father's side were sent to Auschwitz or Treblinka. And here is my father with his grandfather in the next slide. Next slide. So that's in Warsaw in 1938. My great grandfather Samuel was hit over the head by a German soldier while helping an old lady across the street in the Warsaw ghetto and died where he fell. Actually, that was pretty lucky given the fate of the others. That was January, 1942. This is his grave that we had lovingly restored in the Warsaw Cemetery and that's me in 2018. This is my paternal great grandfather in the Warsaw ghetto, um, my grandmother's father. And as you can see, he's wearing the all too familiar armband with the Star of David. These photos were sent out of the ghetto while they were still allowed to do that. Last communication was 1942. They were sent out in these envelopes, which are really chilling. As you can see, they have the stamp of the Third Reich and they have a big Magen David scrawled in red crayon. So obviously they were censored. And on the back of the photo, it actually said, we're all doing fine, but as we know, they weren't. And here is my paternal great grandmother. She's holding a photo of my father as a baby in 1929 when he was born, which they obviously had with him in the ghetto. 
It was sent out to my father and grandparents already safely in Japan in 1941, thanks to a life-saving transit visa from Chuni Sugihara. On the back in Yiddish, it reads, beloved son, I'm sending you a photograph with Michael. You should remember how important every moment is. This boy is my entire pleasure. Hold on to this photo wherever you are and go, Shmuel. Obviously that shook me pretty badly when I had it translated. They all perished. June 1942 was the last communication and we believe they perished in Treblinka. Before the Holocaust, they enjoyed wonderful culturally and socially rich life in Poland, which you can see in the next slide. And then the Nazis invaded amongst the many tens of millions of Gentiles, a tiny handful of exceptional people went against the crowd despite terrible danger to themselves and to their families and helped to save others because in their minds, it was simply the right thing to do. Yad Vashem recognizes these individuals as righteous among the nations. One such individual was Chiuni Sugihara, the Japanese diplomat stationed in Lithuania in 1938. If the last year, 2020 and the recent events in the US have taught us anything at all, they have drummed home how quickly one individual can affect change, positive or negative, and influence a population to act in a way they may have not ordinarily. And with COVID, we have seen how each of us has a responsibility to be selfless at times and act for the greater good. Many individuals working together can have a dramatic impact on events in a positive or a negative way, as we saw in Germany. As a nation of responsible citizens in Australia, for the most part, we did all that we could to contain the spread of the virus, for instance, with fantastic results. That's because there was a great amount of exposure to the dangers of the virus due to widespread education. As far as awareness in the community at large and the Holocaust, information is sorely lacking. After working in advertising, I discovered most of the people knew nothing about the Holocaust. So I always knew one day, somehow I'd like to be involved in educating the masses. I also wanted to write a movie eventually, but it needed to be on a topic that really resonated with me. Most writers write from personal experience and nothing significant really had happened to me at that time that I felt a great need to drop everything I was doing and write a movie. Until about 10 years ago, when my life changed, I discovered from my late father when I was interviewing him that I'm alive today, as are my children and my siblings, because a Japanese diplomat with no connection to the Jewish community, saved my grandparents and my father from the Holocaust together with 6,000 other refugees in Lithuania in 1940. So that was the magic combination for me. I used my creativity in a significant way to assist with Holocaust education, hopefully on a global scale. I'm learning in my research, there is a very common phenomenon amongst survivors. They don't wish to revisit the past. So they compartmentalize their trauma and they focus on the future, on the good. My grandmother and grandfather said goodbye, each of them to their parents in Warsaw at the end of 1939, fled to Lithuania and never saw or heard from them again. I never saw any tears of despair from my grandmother, only love and laughter. She lived life to the absolute fullest. So, who was Chiuni Sugihara? As I said, Sugihara was the Japanese consul in Kaunas, Lithuania. As you know, Japan and Germany were allies, yet he risked his life and that of his young family to defy his government and illegally issue transit visas to 6,000 desperate Jewish refugees, allowing them to leave Lithuania. This is my family's visa, though it's currently in a vault in the National Archives in Canberra, but that's another story I'm in the process of legally sorting out. Chuino Sugihara was quietly dismissed from his position after the war and could no longer get meaningful work in Japan, all for disobeying orders. Being fluent in Russian and seeing opportunity there, he moved and worked away from his family. A survivor located him in Moscow in 1968 and Sugihara survivors petitioned Yad Vashem and he was eventually honored as a righteous among the nations in 1985. Despite this, 
few have ever heard of him. My aim, among other agendas, is to change all of that. Here's what we call in the industry a sizzle reel for you to watch. It's a series of slides, which is a teaser to give you an idea of how the movie we're developing will play out. Bear in mind, we have cut and pasted scenes from current movies in order to achieve this. So the actors you see are not currently employed to work on my movie as yet, but hopefully one day. This film is about a troubled young woman, Rachel Margolin, set in 1968. She's the only child of a very traumatized and disconnected Holocaust surviving father and has lost her mother at age seven. Her grandmother Felka is the matriarch and her rock and is trying to keep the family together. They have assimilated and Rachel doesn't even know she's Jewish. Word gets to Felka that the man who saved her from extermination in 1940, Sugihara, has been located and her grandmother very much wants to go and thank him. Rachel, who is engaged to be married to a Catholic boy, discovers they have hidden her Jewish roots from her in order to shelter her from anti-Semitism. Shocked but fascinated, when she tells him, he breaks off the engagement due to pressure from his quietly anti-Semitic parents. Heartbroken and just graduated as a nurse, she inadvertently finds out Felker is dying of cancer, but can't let her know she knows. She insists on escorting her to Japan. Once they get to Japan, her grandmother reunites with fellow survivors and she realizes her grandmother is regretting the decision to bring her up as a non-Jew and encourages her to learn from them about her heritage, the Holocaust and reconnect with Judaism and her estranged father. The group discovers Sugihara has had to return to Moscow where he now lives. Most can't take that time to go but Felker insists she will. And then tragedy strikes and Felker dies and the grief stricken Rachel is left on her own to cope. And she's taken in by the local Jewish community in Kobe, strangers that she doesn't even know. And she realizes that her grandmother was trying to get her back in touch with her heritage for a reason. And that reason is connection, connection to her culture and her faith and a place to belong. The father comes for the burial because Felker wants to be buried there and demands she comes home. And Rachel defiantly says, no, she's going to Moscow to thank Sugihara and fulfill her dying grandmother's wish and escapes behind the Iron Curtain. Once she gets there, however, she meets her Jewish family, realizes communism is pretty harsh, anti-Semitism is rife. And once again, it, it hits home for her how privileged her life is that she has the opportunity to practice her faith if she wishes, while they face harsh persecution. She goes in search of Sugihara with her cousin leading the way, but they run into trouble and he gets arrested. And going it alone, she finds and pleads with Sugihara to help. In the meantime, her father Michael has chased to Moscow, fearing for her safety. She learns from Sugihara how difficult it would be for her father as a young boy fleeing a happy home seeing persecution and escaping death. And she slowly learns to really understand her father's damage through this meeting. She ends up confronting and chastising her father for being so closed. Through this process and the meeting with Sugihara, they unlock repressed memories in Michael, which cause a catharsis in her father and results in Rachel and her father reconnecting on a level they never have before. So as you can see, in summary, the film is set in 1968 and inspired by Chuni Sugihara's bravery about a motherless young woman who embarks on a journey with her survivor grandmother to thank the Gentile who saved her estranged father during the Holocaust and in the process gains the knowledge she can use to forge the emotional connection with him she so desperately needs. But my desire is that it be a story that represents us all as Jews and descendants of the Holocaust and deals with the impact of trauma on survivors and the next generation, which I don't believe has been tackled in film to date. We are all this next generation and it is our duty to perpetuate the memory of those whose voices were silenced 
We also need to support each other and share in this unique experience of being the offspring of individuals who went through a unique experience, which has impacted on their ability to live normally and to parent normally. Many of us are damaged. And as a result of that, Hitler's work had far reaching consequences, as we all know. The more I connect with descendants worldwide, the more I see the urgency to highlight this. So why this film now? There is certainly a continual interest in films about the Holocaust and post-Holocaust survivors. The kind of anti-Semitism that was widespread between the wars, which was quieted only temporarily during the Holocaust, has raised its head again with the Charlie Hebdo massacre, the Pittsburgh attack, far-right extremism, countless acts of anti-Semitism daily worldwide, which is proving why we can't ignore it. Even now with the global coronavirus pandemic and some in the Black Lives Matter movement, the world wants a scapegoat. And of course, it's the Jews. My husband's father survived Auschwitz physically, but never really recovered, tragically taking his own life when my husband was just 16. Because of our shared Holocaust related experience, we are very passionate about fostering education on this topic so the world never forgets and the world and the next generation is educated. Recent studies undertaken just last year have concluded that 30% of US youth and 50% of the youth of Europe do not know about the Holocaust. And that is really alarming. My goal is to create something lasting that will inadvertently educate a global audience with the reach that only cinema has so that the world never forgets. Some will argue they can simply read a book on the topic or go into a museum or watch a documentary. I say to those people, the bottom line is Hollywood style drama is more attractive to the average person than a documentary. And unlike museums, which are static and need people to physically walk into them, cinema flows out to small communities and to small villages and is way more accessible. And many people don't actually bother going to museums. Nobody had ever heard of Oscar Schindler until Spielberg's movie was released. Here is a tiny snippet of him talking about the impact and why the re-release in 2018, 25 years later, was so important. The list is an absolute good. It was a box office hit. I was the only one that wanted to shoot the picture in black and white. No, the studio didn't. A powerful film about the Holocaust that for so many was so much more than a movie. They say that no one dies here. They say your factory is a haven. It inspired survivors to share their stories. They stripped him from everything. Educating the world. It wouldn't have happened without Schindler's List. The show of foundation wouldn't have existed. Is this an important time to re-release this film? I, guess, I think this is maybe the most important time to re-release this form. Possibly now is even a more important time to re-release Schindler's List than 19, uh, you know, 93, 94 when it was initially released. I think there's more at stake today than even back then. Now look at some messages I had on social media from Gentiles all over the world when I recently posed the question on social media. Shout out if you've never heard of Schindler and talked about the reach only cinema can deliver. One person said, I had never heard of Oscar Schindler and yet cried for weeks after seeing Schindler's List and learning the story of all he did and those he saved. I too will be looking up Sugihara and will look for your movie to be made. And another, totally agree, Linda. I knew nothing about Schindler before I watched the movie. Cinema, without any doubt, is a very powerful medium of passing on information or a message across masses. And finally, Schindler's List is a movie that changes you forever. You have my curiosity. I'll have to look up Sugihara. Thanks for sharing. So this has the greatest chance it can of succeeding in a very tough industry. I have taken on a highly experienced screenwriter, Nicholas Lathouris, who was one of the principal writers of Mad Max Fury Road and works regularly with uh, George Miller and a very talented young writer, Joshua Lundberg, to assist me. 
And like Spielberg achieved with Shoah, we are keen to assist in sharing Sugihara survivors and descendants stories and create a social impact campaign that works alongside the film that shines a light on anti-Semitism, the Holocaust and generational trauma, which is really, really important. Um, I'd also like to go into schools with a program on righteous Gentiles and how the power of one person going against the crowd can make a dramatic impact on the world. The great news is that the Australian Cultural Fund approved us last year as not-for-profit because we don't realise any profit and is assisting us in raising finance, which under their umbrella means contributions are tax deductible. I've dedicated my time pro bono for at least five years, if not longer at the moment to get this off the ground. My husband and I have self-funded to date and should this film end up realising any profit, down the track, we would put all monies we see personally back into Holocaust education worldwide. I have great media coverage, including an article in each of the Jewish Chronicle in the UK, the largest publication there, who ran a double page spread, the AJN, the Australian Jewish Post, the Guardian, JWire, plus a radio interview with ABC Radio National, which also ran as a world news article online. And I'll just play you a bit now. What are you hoping to achieve with the movie that instead of, I don't know, running tours to Japan or volunteering at a museum, like okay. why, why this? Cinema has the reach, whatever the subject matter, that no museum can. Most of us learned about everything from cinema, whether it's Hitler, Pol Pot, the sexual revolution, whatever. It encourages you to then seek more information and go and look at the facts and documentaries. So it also has the reach you know, you can't have a Jewish museum or a Holocaust museum in every city in the world. How have other people, either from the survivors and descendants groups or other people not connected to the story, what's the response been like? Oh. And have you had any criticism? Well, it wasn't even a criticism. It was a, it was a questioning by one of the descendants who, when I was asking them for funding, if they wanted to help out, said why should we give money to you you know rather than people who are doing documentaries and when i pitched to them the fact that the bottom line is that people want to be entertained and that's really the way to get to them and that it has a really important job even as much or more so than a museum they were pretty much convinced other survivors and other descendants think it's a very noble thing that i'm doing because they think that any education and anything that highlights anti-semitism and educates the world on the holocaust is a valuable tool Okay, I've also had an endorsement from Steven Spielberg's sister, who is a producer and director, Nancy Spielberg, when I sent her uh, my synopsis and uh, my pitch deck. And she said, hi, Linda, I can feel your passion in telling your story and find healing through this email. How wonderful that you're making this effort to share this story and make sure that it in turn is shared with the next generations. It is truly bone chilling seeing the rise in anti-Semitism. It's not even an occasional event these days. Instead, it is a multiple times a day occurrence. I do understand that this is a story that goes way beyond the Holocaust and encompasses the incredible acts of Sugihara. I do think that with your passion and with your perseverance, you will see this to fruition. I'm wishing you all the best of luck with this film. All the best, Nancy Spielberg, Playmount Productions. Well, I'm not Spielberg, so I need the assistance of the Jewish community at large. And uh, I'm trying to start with the Australian Jewish community. I've had the odd comment that this is a commercial venture. Not for me. My aim is not to make money. My husband's name, um, aim is not to make money. I say to them, I want only two things from this, that Sugihara becomes a household name like Schindler and highlights to the world the need to think for oneself if you see wrong being done, and that I have created a piece of impactful, entertaining writing and cinema that will endure for generations to come. Of course, I'm a writer and like any artist, we, deserve, we derive our pleasure from other people's reactions to our work. That will be reimbursement enough for me. I hope to get assistance from the government, but the reality is approaching the government funding bodies is a long shot for a Jewish Holocaust themed film in this country at least. My chances are therefore slim at best. 
Unfortunately, anti-Semitism is always alive and the reality is it is always there, even in subtle ways such as saying no to projects such as this. Jews helping Jews is what we've always done as a people for our continued survival. We need Jews in this country funding Jewish arts. But this early stage of script development takes finance. Once the script is ready, we have a solid foundation with which to bring in major investment through a film studio, maybe even Spielberg. No individual puts up that money themselves, not even Spielberg. My family will continue, however, to match dollar for dollar as far as we can, any donations that we receive. It would be wonderful if this vital early stage of this venture that represents us all as survivors and descendants of the darkest time in our people's history could be assisted by the Jewish community in getting it to market. And a solid script and book, I've actually been approached by a publisher, which is pretty exciting, handed over to a producer here in Hollywood and at the conclusion of the movie, a tribute is proposed by us as Schindler had to pay respect to all of the survivors and descendants and to all of us who had the vision to help make this happen. The movie script deals with a fictional story about a real hero, not my personal story. I was not 21 years old in 1968, I was only seven. That is designed to represent all of us as survivors and descendants of the Holocaust a story that will educate the world, Jews and non-Jews, about thinking for themselves as Sugihara did and doing what is right and the impact of that. Ultimately, it is our ambitious desire that it has the impact Schindler had and still does. Contributions can be made at the Australian Cultural Fund. There is a link here and hopefully we'll be able to um, keep that up just for a little while while people, if they're interested, can take a screenshot or jot it down. Otherwise it can be sent to you later. We've got about 10 days left on the crowdfunding. And again, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Cedric and March of the Living and thank you, all of you who actually came on and listened to me tonight um, and hearing my story and journey. As March of the Living's slogan says, Go where history books can't, and in my case, that's into cinemas. Thank you very, very much. And now I'm going to hand over to Rabbi Levy Wolf for some information on his personal connection to this incredible human being. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was so wonderful. Outstanding presentation. You are indeed a very talented individual and we are all wishing you tremendous strength and success in creating what we know will be a most fascinating film on Chuni Sagihara. To the representatives of March of the Living Australia, who are really changing the perceptions that people have about the Shoah and transforming lives, tens of thousands of people, thank you for having me on tonight and for creating formats like this. And finally, as they say in Japanese, Acharon, Acharon Chaviv. The best is left for the last. It is an honor to have with us today the son of the hero we are all here tonight to pay tribute to. Now, Buki, welcome. I'd like to say a few words to you and to the people that I hope are listening. I remember reading that when they built Yad Vashem in Jerusalem after the Holocaust. They built, as we know it now, a very special area, which is a memorial to the righteous Gentiles, as it's referred to in Israel, Chasidei Umat HaOlam, who risked their lives while saving Jews. Some years back, there was a delegation of French Holocaust survivors who made a unique request to Yad Vashem. This is what they asked for. A seemingly simple one. That just as Yad Vashem had a special area dedicated to righteous Gentiles who had helped save Jews during the Holocaust, Yad Vashem should also consider to have a special area dedicated to righteous Jews who helped save 
fellow Jews during the Holocaust. And let me tell you what Robert Rosette of Yad Vashem said at the time. He said no. Why? Well, basically, it boils down to two fundamental reasons. Number one, it would be hard because so many Jews help their fellow Jews. In other words, I don't think, or in his words, I don't think you can talk about any story of Jewish survival in which a Jew wasn't helped by another Jew. But really what I want to tell you is the second reason he gave. It was the rest of a sentence that provided the real answer when he said, we expect a Jew to help their fellow Jew. Do you appreciate what that means? It means that Christians who saved Jews in the Holocaust were exercising a choice. They didn't have to do it. They could have just thrown their hands up like many, many did and said, there's nothing we could do. So those who did help should be honored and should be acknowledged for their major efforts. But for a Jew, a Jew helping another Jew, that was not a matter of choice. That's simply a responsibility. Saving a fellow Jew is to be expected. And so it deserves no special honors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not even sure if doing what Sugihara did for the Jews would be expected of another Jew. But for Sugihara, it surely wasn't expected. And we owe him so much for what he did for so many of us. Most of us, of course, know the story. Linda touched on it as World War II was breaking out and the Nazi tanks were rolling through Poland. My grandfather, like so many Jews, were desperate to get out of Europe. And Abuki's father looked out the window of his residence one morning, and as Nabuki's mother described it, quoted from her, we saw hundreds of men and women outside lining up to speak to my husband. But we could see there was a very deep sadness on their faces. And they learned of their desperate need to escape Europe. And they begged him to issue them transport visas to take them to Japan. This, of course, would be the only way for them to save their lives and the lives of their young children. Sugihara quickly sent off a cable to Japan requesting his government for, ad for advice. If he could issue transport visas, but the response that he received was not positive. He knew that it was now all up to him. And over the next two nights, he couldn't sleep. He was well aware of how the lives of so many innocent men, women, and children were now in his hands. His government told him one thing, but his conscience told him that God wanted him to do something else. And so began an amazing turn of events that changed the history and the lives of first tens of Jews, then hundreds of Jews, and then thousands of people. Sugihara began issuing and filling out visa by visa for every single Jew, each at a time. He was so inundated, overwhelmed by the now hundreds of people who he had heard of, who had heard what he was doing, and time was against them. The Germans were closing in, and with no time, they'd soon very, much, very quickly be trapped with absolutely nowhere to go. He worked days, he worked nights. He had to put ice on his hand, on his arms, on his hand to calm down the swelling of the amount of pressure that his, his arm had endured from writing and writing all day and all night, all against the direction of the very government 
that he was working for. And even in the last hours, after he was summoned and told to leave from the very train, Sugihara was still signing visas and kept throwing them out the window to the helpless Jews turning to him in their last hour. My grandfather, Rabbi Cheskel Deren, a young teenager at the time, was one of the many fortunate Jews to be a recipient. In fact, my Zeta's name is found on the very last lines on the now known documented list of Sugihara's list. Dear Nabuki, it is because of your father that I am here today. And as you heard before, I am not alone. I and so many others owe a debt of gratitude to your dear father and to your family. Your grandfather had nothing but a single stamp and a pen in his hand and a conscience in his heart. And look today at the thousands of people, descendants of Sugihara's recipients. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the power of what one person can do. I think of my family. Because of Sugihara, my grandfather was blessed to build a family, to have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and we number in the several hundreds, all from one visa issued to Chetzkul, the Chetzkul Derem. Times that number by each of the 6,000 plus who he saved, and you have one man who has literally saved tens and tens of thousands of lives. He had all the reason to say no. After all, he was putting his own life at risk, the life of his wife and the life of their family. He had all the excuses to turn away, but his conscience would not allow him to do that. So if we ever think of Sugihara, think of the courage of what one man can do and what one man like you and I can also do. What one single person standing up for what he or she believes is right and just because of one, tens of thousands of people are alive today, each in their own way, doing good for our shared world. Judaism has always taught us it takes one person to change the world. Who are the Sugiharas of our generation? It can and it should be me and you, any Jew or any non-Jew. We can stand up for what is right and to be there to help others. Nabuki, the Jewish people, have a long memory. We never forget. We never forget those who stand up to help us in the face of injustice. We will never forget what people like your father have done for us. You protected us at our most vulnerable and desperate time of need. And for that and for more, the Jewish people are eternally grateful to you. Toda, thank you so very much. So I'd just like to thank uh, Rabbi Wolf and Linda for sharing those uh, fascinating insights and intensely uh, personal stories, uh, obviously both having affected your respective families and uh, you can hear the passion in both your voices and how much this means to you. So thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I have had a few questions come through and uh, 
Linda, if you forgive me, there are a few questions pertaining to the video, the movie, but I would actually like Rabbi Wolf's perspective on it because I think it will be quite illustrative. So I'm going to address a few questions to you, Rabbi, um, the first of which um, is, is really about a concept you were talking about now. But if you could please comment further on the extent of the mitzvah of doing the right thing whilst putting oneself at risk with reference to tikkun olam, which is such a guiding principle for Jewish people. Well, you know, there's a beautiful Mishnah in the tractate of Sanhedrin that tells us that when you save one single person, you're actually saving an entire world. Tikkun olam means to fix the world, to amend the world, to perfect the world. But think about saving the world, never mind perfecting the world. So I think it would be tikkun olam on steroids when you go and save another human being. And as I mentioned earlier, think about the impact one human being is actually uh, an injustice because that one human being has the potential. Like I look at my grandfather, Rabbi Chesko, and Kenai Nahara, the hundreds and hundreds of descendants of that one person. So I think there could be no greater title and no greater expression of Tikkun Olam than to really associate that with uh, the amazing selfless acts of Sugihara. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So two questions that pertain to the, the movie. Um, now, given that the story is so personal for you and your family, I'd like your perspective on how important you feel that uh, these stories are to be about Sugihara and all his incredible deeds and what he did for so many are, are shared and heard by the masses. And then a uh, second point there related is uh, your thoughts around needing to educate people in today's time. So we heard about the re-screening uh, uh, of Shinder's List two years, well now almost three years ago. Um, and we've heard about the uptick in anti-Semitic uh, events and uh, trends that are very concerning. So if you look at it in today's times and just about education in general, the importance of movies like this going out to the masses and these stories being shared and heard. So I think Linda said it best. And that is that uh, the reality of today's world is that uh, the classroom, traditional classroom way of communicating, uh, even, even museums, unfortunately, are not as impactful as social media entertainment. Uh, the younger generation who need to be taught and be educated, more than anyone, re responds to entertainment and social media. Um, there can be no more powerful tool to bring a message of education to a desperately needed generation where, as we've heard, what's happening today with anti-Semitism and everything else. Imagine if you can, I remember when we had Sugihara's grandson in our shul and we had the uh, council general, I invited the then Japanese council general who was serving here in Sydney to come join us. And he and his wife walked over to me after the service. And after I spoke about uh, what Sugihara, who was also a consul general in Lithuania did, and he and his wife, and they weren't necessarily the most um, emotional people when you met them earlier on in the morning. And to see them standing in front of me with tears, that they were educated and they were taught that they also can have the opportunity to see the world and to stand up for injustice. And if we can communicate that, and the best way to communicate that, in my opinion today, is in ways that people relate to. How do, how do kids relate to? How does the younger generation, how do the 20s and 30 year olds today relate to better than entertainment? And if we can take powerful messages and really package them in a way that's effective so that they can rethink how the Jewish people ought to be treated and God forbid, what are they doing when others are suffering? I mean, uh, Linda, you're on to something very, very important. And I really pray and hope that you get the well-deserved support on every level to uh, 
do what Spielberg was able to do with Schindler so that we can do here with Sugihara. Well, thank you. Uh, I have two questions for Linda and then hopefully we'll have time if appropriate for Nabuki to say a few things at, at your discretion if you'd like to. So the two questions uh, pertain to the film. Um, one is how do we watch the film? I think that was uh, asked before you got to that point, but I, th I think you can respond to that. And then uh, there was a question, will, there be, will mention be made in the film of the Dutch, uh, I think it should say consulate as well, whose issuing of visas to Kuroko was just as important? Okay, uh, number one, uh, how can you watch the film <laughs> when it's made? I'm hoping you'll be able to watch it in wide release in many countries. At the moment, it's just in uh, early stage development in script form. And we're hoping to um, attract a producer, director, film studio um, with our writing skills. So we're in very early, you know, that's why we need this seed funding, which is vital because we don't have a film studio attached as yet. Once there is a film studio attached, it'll hopefully take off and uh, they can do with it what they like and promote it and get it out there for us. Um, as for the other question, sorry, which what the other question was? It's uh, about the Dutch consulate. Oh, oh, right. So the Dutch consul is uh, was a vital uh, player in this. In fact, what happened was the story goes, there were two um, yeshiva students who were Dutch and they were stuck and they couldn't go back to the Netherlands. And so they went to the Dutch consul and said they'd like to go somewhere um, in the United States or close to the United States. And they found a little colony called Curacao. And he said, yes, I can actually issue you papers there, but you'll have to go to the Japanese consul and get a transit visa in order to get to Curacao. So they did. Um, his name was Jan Zwartendijk. He is a righteous among the nations. And absolutely, he will be made mention of in this process without question. He is, uh, nothing could have happened without the two of them. Um, and yes, he has been honored by Yad Vashem as well. Um, so what happened was those two then went out into the community, word got around that uh, these two consuls were uh, doing this thing. He was issuing a paper or a document of some sort, it wasn't a visa, and that uh, Chiuni Sugihara was issuing visas. So they all, Yes, swarmed the uh, Japanese consul and Yukiko opened the, the curtains and they couldn't believe their eyes, all these desperate people um, who wanted to get a transit visa to Japan. And he asked three times, three times he asked Japan, please, can I help these desperate people? Three times the Japanese government said, under no circumstances are you to issue visas to these refugees. And he defied his government at great risk and he uh, issued 2,000 visas, which covered approximately 6,000 Jews. Wow. Okay. Right. So thank you. Uh, we, we haven't had any further questions come through, at least not to me. So I was just wondering, um, Nobuki, thank you for joining us. I will invite you to say a few words if you would like to. Um, if not, that's fine. But if you'd like to say anything, thank you very much for joining. Uh, Rabbi Wolf, maybe if you can do a brief uh, reintroduction as appropriate. Certain legends need no introduction. <laughs> and I think Nabuki, today we're very, very privileged to be able to have you with us and a great honor to be able to hear just some of your thoughts that you might have. Thank you. You might have to unmute yourself if you want to say something. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the meeting today. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm living in Belgium. I left Japan 53 years ago. No, 52 years ago. And uh, I was 19 years old. I was invited by Israeli government and uh, uh, world a Jewish Congress to study in Jerusalem in the Hebrew University because they found my father in 1968 that uh, one diplomat came to Tokyo 
and he was uh, one of the visa recipients. Finally, he found my father, and uh, until that day, I didn't know what he did, my father did. I knew that he issued a few hundred visa to some Polish people. This, is, this was all my parents told me. So that day, I could find out small part of the truth because my father never talked, my mother didn't know much about. And uh, I went to Israel two weeks later. I got paid air ticket and uh, university and uh, uh, student dormitory. I was studying in the Hebrew University economics. And very slowly I happened, I started to know what was Holocaust, what happened to the Jewish people in World War II or before. It took me a long time to know what's the Holocaust. In 1970, one year later, I came to Israel. My father visited me. We met uh, Dr. Baruch Haftik. Uh, he was the minister of religions in Israel at that time. And uh, uh, deputy uh, mayor of Tel Aviv, uh, Mr. Uh, Klementinovsky. They were the survivors, two survivors. They told the story how they could get visa from my father and they traveled to Japan by Siberia and they could move to uh, United States and after that to Israel. Slowly, slowly, during another 20 years, I was not staying in the university for 20 years, but I, I entered business in diamonds in Israel, in Ramatugan. So I was working in Israel and I was working also in Japan in two places. I met few people, few survivors. I heard about Lithuania, Poland. I hope Linda's movie will be the right history of my father and the survivors. And the truth is the is nothing, how can I say, nothing is more uh, dramatic than truth. I asked once my father when he was 82, why did you say, why did you issue a visa to refugees? He said, well, they had no place, nowhere to go. So I just felt pity. That was a reason no, not to be hero, not to be great, not to obey the God, nothing. My, my father was not Christian, or he had no religions. We don't have religion in our family. So that was my father's word. Just felt pity. Very simple man but he, he loves people. He, respect, he respects every person. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much for today's meeting. Uh, thank you, a very big thank you to you. It's really a privilege to hear from you and hear that story. And uh, obviously uh, as the son of someone who did so much uh, to hear it almost from the horse's mouth, it's, it's really a, a, an honor to have heard that story from you. Thank you very much for, for going into those details. And so I'd just like to thank all the speakers today. I think it was an exceptional discussion and recount of some very important events. Um, and just to let everyone know, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded onto various channels. It will be shared in the March of the Living newsletter. And uh, our intent is to uh, spread the educational word so that more people are aware of these things and these, uh, uh, what, what happened before and what's going on now. So you can look out for further educational webinars that will be happening regularly during the course of the, this year and beyond. It's stories like these that really do need to be heard and told. So uh, I think 
with that, there's no further questions. So we will bring the meeting to a close and thank you very much for, for listening and thank you to all the speakers. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Nabuki.